Michael Popak, legal layoff. Until now, the U.S. Supreme Court has stayed firmly on the sidelines of things related to Donald Trump, immunity at defense, insurrection, or January 6th election interference. Not any longer. Those days are over. Two cases have now been brought up to the U.S. Supreme Court by a vote by the justices in their caucus that they want to hear two cases. They are bookends, they are companion pieces, and they are messaging to Jack Smith at the Department of Justice. And I'll try to interpret it all in this breakout legal AF law school session I call a hot take. Here we go. Let's start from the beginning. The first thing is that uh, first, and, and I think the order of operation is important, the U.S. Supreme Court notified Jack Smith that the, Depart- the special counsel, that they are willing to at least have the briefing around the issue on an expedited emergency basis, whether Donald Trump, A, has immunity to have his indictment uh, vacated, dismissed in the District of Columbia. And the, and the more important po- point, will the Supreme Court take up that issue on a direct appeal, skipping over the, the lower level appellate court in the District of Columbia? Because how it's supposed to go is you start with the trial level judge, you got a bad decision, you take it to the uh, her bosses, which in this case is the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, three judge panel. You don't like that, then your next stop on the train is, is the Supreme Court. Except in extraordinary circumstances, the US Supreme Court as the the lawgiver of the land as the ultimate arbiter and interpreter of the Constitution for really important cases like this one could decide they're going to uh, throw over a little bit of procedure and they're going to take the appeal themselves. These nine justices are going to weigh in on this issue directly and not wait for it to come up through lower courts. We saw a sort of a version of this, for instance, in Bush versus Gore and the presidential election cycle back in 2000. So the first thing they did is they told the world and Jack Smith, you want to brief us on the issue? Brief us on the issue as to why we have direct appellate jurisdiction now to decide this case on an expedited basis and brief it. And right now, Donald Trump and the Department of Justice is doing just that. The District of Columbia, the lower level appellate court, is briefing the issue too. So One of two things are going to happen. District of Columbia either gets it because the Supreme Court says we're giving it back to our lower level uh, appellate court to handle first. We'll see you on the next go around, but not directly now. Or the Supreme Court says, no, we're going to cut out the middleman. We're going to make the decision for ourselves right now. That's that. What's the next message that came up? Because I said there were two. The next message that came up is that they took a case and decided that they wanted to make a make new law or interpret law about whether the the Department of Justice has properly used the obstruction of official proceeding crime against Jan 6 defendants. Uh, And they're going to decide once and for all whether that statute that that allows for obstruction of official proceeding which was passed in 2002 by the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley cases um, uh, arising out of those uh, line of statutes, whether that was properly applied and mapped onto the conduct of Jan 6th insurrectionists and defendants. The Department of Justice used that count and has been using that count even against Donald Trump. It's one of the most potent crimes in their arsenal. It carries with it, I think it's a 20 or 25 year prison sentence. And other than seditious conspiracy, it's the highest number thing on the board for crimes. So the question is, was it proper to use it? Did Congress intend, once they put it on the books, since that statute arose out of the white collar criminal world of like the Enron financial fraud cases and things like that, not about, of course, an attack on the Capitol. Can you use it for an attack on the Capitol? Because you can't create new new statutes. Uh, a prosecutor can't create a new crime. He has to take existing criminal statutes and map them onto the conduct. Sometimes prosecutors get attacked for being... Uh, Uh, using the prosecutorial discretion to overcharge the case. When you hear the concept of overcharging a case, it means there are crimes that they could have charged, but they overcharged it, stretching the facts to fit a higher dollar value, if you will, a higher penalty value 
uh, crime than it probably warranted. And that's called overcharging. And that's embedded in this discussion about whether the obstruction of an official proceeding applies to what happens on Jan 6th. It requires that somebody corruptly, and that is the word that's used that animates the statute, whether they corruptly attempted to stop, in this case, the peaceful transfer of power by the uh, stopping the Senate's uh, <clears throat> affirmation of the certificates of um, of the electors, right? Stopping the certification of the electoral certificates, that would be the corrupt um, interference. And the corrupt part would include using weapons and attacks and, and other things to try to stop the count. That's, that's the whole law. Now, <clears throat> a lower level judge, Judge Nichols, thought that the prosecutors had overcharged the case, that that statute doesn't apply to this kind of conduct, and he dismissed that count. Why it's so devastating is because that charge has been used on hundreds of Jan 6 defendants, including Donald Trump. Two of his four indict indicted counts in the District of Columbia by the special counsel arise out of this particular obstruction of an official proceeding. If they were to go, it doesn't mean he, he's scot-free because there's still two more counts in there related to uh, voter suppression and, uh, and fraud on the government. But the ones that are at the heart of his case with the highest dollar value, point value, are these obstruction of official proceedings. So the question is, by back-to-back -back deciding, I don't because the Supreme Court doesn't do anything by accident, in telling Jack Smith on one hand, on one day, that we'll take the fast briefing and decide the issue of whether we have original direct jurisdiction over the immunity issue, whether Donald Trump is immune, he can do whatever crimes he wants while he was president, whether he was acting as president or not acting as president, or after he was president, because he can avoid indictment altogether, let alone criminal conviction, that question, two days later, they said, oh, by the way, we want to stick our nose into the Jan 6th issue and decide whether the highest count that you fellow Department of Justice prosecutors have been using against uh, Americans is proper or not. And I think there's a messaging in there. I think at the end of the day, the Supreme Court has decided they needed now, now, at the end of 2023 to finally assert themselves, and that because of the trial schedule that's happening in Georgia and in the federal courts against Donald Trump, they better hurry up and make the decision if they want it to impact one way or the other, the pursuit of justice before the election. I still have a sinking feeling and a sneaking suspicion that even the majority on this U.S. Supreme Court believes it's important that the public learn whether Donald Trump is a convicted criminal or exonerated before the election. Now, normally, on a normal track, the Jan 6th obstruction count appeal issue just being brought up to the Supreme Court now in their meetings would really not be decided until April, May, June. If the trial of Donald Trump happens in March, that doesn't really help him. Although if he got convicted of the counts that eventually get thrown out by the Department of Justice, you know, he'd have grounds to appeal. But if they don't speed things up, the earliest these decisions sometimes come out, unless they're leaked, like the abortion decision last year is closer to May and June, which doesn't help Donald Trump necessarily for his March trial date that's still on the books. So you have We'll, we'll have to see how they set the briefing for that. But they may just want to decide that the Department of Justice, you know, strengthen their hand. The Department of Justice was right. This crime was on the books. Yes, we understand the legislative history, but just like the legislative history of a lot of crimes on the books, they can be extended into other novel situations when they arose. Sure, Congress in 2002, or no Congress, has ever envisioned a Donald Trump, but you've got to take existing law and map it onto conduct. And it's not a, ma a matter of overcharging. It's a matter of using existing law properly against novel conduct. And I think that's where the U.S. Supreme Court can come out and should come out on that particular issue. At the same time, if I was a betting man and flipping a coin, I think they're going to take the direct appeal. I think they're going to say, rather than wait and waste time, this is of such public importance, given the fact that a former president is on trial for his liberty uh, right in the middle of a, a campaign season, 
as he's running for re-election, we should decide this issue once and for all now. We don't need the lower level record. They have the right to do that. And I think like a Hoover vacuum cleaner, they suck this case up directly away from the D.C. Court of Appeals and make their decision themselves. They'll have full briefing through the month of December. It may impinge on people's holidays. We don't take holidays here at the Midas Touch Network, so it won't impact us. And we'll get a ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court, I think, relatively soon. Could be as early as the first week in January as to whether they're going to take the case or not for Jack Smith. And if they take the case, they're going to decide once and for all the issue, not just for Donald Trump, but 100 years from now or 50 years from now, about whether a president, while he was in office, who does the things that Donald Trump is alleged to have done to cling to power, can escape criminal liability under some sort of immunity uh, defense or immunity analysis. I mean, we do need to know the answer to that question. I think the answer to that question, based on all the precedent of case law cited until now, is that he can't. Once he ex goes beyond the outer boundaries of his own office as the president and starts acting like campaigner in chief, clinging to power in chief Donald Trump, he's crossed the line into the world of criminal conduct. I think that's the right result. We'll follow it and we'll follow this messaging because there's no way it was a random occurrence. On the same week, uh, two days apart, Supreme Court says, we'll, we are interested in this, this immunity issue, and we may take jurisdiction on it. Let's do fast briefing, briefing on it. Thank you for bringing it to our attention, Mr. Smith. And oh, by the way, Mr. Smith and the rest of the Department of Justice, we're going to finally declare, so you don't have to worry anymore, once and for all, that the obstruction of an official proceeding is a proper count related to a Jan 6th insurrectionist, including somebody named Donald Trump, who has two of those counts on his own personal indictment. That's the way this could shake out. The negative way to analyze it is they want to hurry up, get the immunity issue up with them, and then give Donald Trump immunity. And at the same time, they want to let a whole bunch of people out of jail because there's hundreds of people that would have their sentences and their convictions vacated as a result of throwing that off the books and declaring that, no, it doesn't matter what it says literally in the statute. That's not what it was intended for. And therefore, you can't use it for the novel a conduct of insurrection that happened on Jan 6. I just don't think that's going to happen. And there's, you know, yes, there'll be a couple of people that'll side with Donald Trump and with the insurrectionists. I can name two of them right now, Sam Alito and Clarence Thomas. But the rest of the group have not as of yet on issues related to Donald Trump and Trump and this constitutional republic and the separation of powers and the peaceful transfer of power have not yet crossed over to the dark side. So we'll continue to follow all of that. I'll do it on hot takes like this one about every day, if not every hour, at the intersection of law, politics, and justice. I do it one place and one place only. You know it, you're here watching me. It's on the YouTube channel for Midas Touch. Every week, twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays, 8 p.m., we curate a podcast we call Legal AF. It's exactly what you think. Wednesday and Saturdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, you can watch us live on YouTube, or you can pick it up on audio podcast platforms of your choice. So if you like what I'm doing here, thumbs up, please, and a comment. It really does help with the ratings and keeps me on the air. And until my next hot take, till my next Legal AF, this is Michael Popak reporting. Thanks so much for watching. We're only a few subscribers short of 2 million subs. Please subscribe right now to the Midas Touch YouTube channel for free and help us grow this unapologetically pro-democracy network.